All right, welcome. We're going to take a look today at chapter seven. And chapter seven is going to go in depth into the chemical reactions of photosynthesis. So this is absolutely one of the more complicated chapters, um, not to scare you, but it is a lot of step-by-step -step chemical reactions and like how they work. Um, so please feel free to use the extra resources. Feel free to ask me questions, whether that's via email or office hours, um, to look through your book and um, really, really try as hard as you can to, to go through this as many times as you need um, because it, it is a lot. Um, that being said, I'm going to do my best to break it down as easily as I can for you so that it doesn't feel so overwhelming. Um, there will be a lot of memorizing vocab words and processes, um, which is not my favorite way to do learning, but it is the really only way that this ends up making sense. So that's my disclaimer. Just take your time as we go through this. So we're going to start first with things that do photosynthesis. Then it's going to be the process of photosynthesis. Then how plants convert this energy, how plants fix carbon dioxide, and then the kinds or types of photosynthesis. So let's go ahead and, and get into it. So the first thing that your book talks about is how photosynthesis is this key to figuring out fuel and how we're going to do this now and into the future. So plant scientists, botanists, and biochemists are trying to hijack and tweak basic chemistry of photosynthesis in order to make fuels and oils. Um, one example is this Carmelina, which is this drought resistant oil seed crop that scientists are using to make photosynthesis, photosynthesis very efficient and to use it for genetic engineering purposes and ultimately improving how carbon dioxide gets absorbed in a plant so that we can make more energy. Um, and it's been pretty successful um, and, and it's ongoing work. So this will be um, also important in climate change things if we can hack photosynthesis and um, sequester more carbon out of our atmosphere, if we can um, also make more oxygen, that's good news. So this kind of science is, is ongoing. Another example is terpene, which is this really high energy molecule that pine trees make that we then make turpentine with. You may be familiar with turpentine as like a thing that can dissolve paint and clean paintbrushes. Um, and it's not its only use because we're trying to make airplane fuel with these um, turpentine type molecules. All right, so now that you know like some of the cool science that is happening, um, we know that all of the life on Earth is going to depend on solar energy. There are photosynthetic organisms. That's going to be algae and cyanobacteria. And then the most common one that you are familiar with is plants. They are going to take solar energy and turn that solar energy into chemical energy in the bonds of carbohydrates. So we call these organisms that do photosynthesis autotrophs because they are making their own food. They're making carbohydrates that they then use to make ATP. We know that process is called photosynthesis. It's the process where we capture solar energy 
Then we transform solar energy into chemical energy, and that energy is stored in a carbohydrate. So photo means light, and synthesis we know means to build up, so it's using light to build up a glucose molecule. Uh, photosynthesizers produce food energy that will then feed themselves as well as heterotrophs. Heterotrophs we also know as consumers. Those are the things that eat plants or eat the organisms that eat plants. Both autotrophs and heterotrophs are using organic molecules made in photosynthesis as a source of chemical energy to make ATP to do work in a cell. So photosynthesis at its very basis is this chemical process to capture energy from the sun, turn it into chemical energy that then is used by other organisms. Photosynthesis is going to take place in the green part of plants. Usually this is going to be the leaf of a, of a flowering plant. It has a special type of tissue called mesophyll tissue. And those mesophyll tissue cells contain chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are the organelles designed or specialized to carry out photosynthesis. In the last chapter, we looked at the chemical formula for photosynthesis, but we have the raw materials of carbon dioxide and water. How do we get those or where are they at in the plant's environment? Roots absorb water for the plant and it moves up the vascular tissue. We call it xylem. Carbon dioxide comes through the leaves from the air around it um, through these little holes or openings called stomata and then it is able to diffuse into the chloroplast cells in the cells. In the chloroplast we know from learning about the organelles there's the thylakoid membrane and those are going to have the chlorophyll and any other pigments that can absorb that solar energy. When we absorb the solar energy, the electrons are energized, and then we can use that energy. Um, carbon dioxide is reduced, and we make sugar. So in the stroma of the chloroplasts, that's where we're having carbon dioxide combining with water, and that's making a sugar. C6H12O6 is the sugar glucose. So we're getting water from the roots up into the plant. We are getting carbon dioxide from the air around it coming in through the leaves. We are capturing sunlight in the chloroplasts. Chemical reactions are turning water and carbon dioxide into a sugar in the plant. Here's this process for you. Solar energy shines down on the plants. Photosynthesis gives us oxygen and glucose. Oxygen and glucose are taken up by heterotrophs, consumers. They are going to do cell respiration uh, where they release water and carbon dioxide that goes back to plants. And that cellular respiration gives them ATP, chemical energy for their cells to do work. If we look specifically at the leaf, we can see these very tightly packed arranged cells. That's going to be that mesophyll where we are going to see chlorophyll in our chloroplasts. Uh, and that main job of those uh, thylakoids is to have that chlorophyll that will capture the sunlight and drive photosynthesis. We can break photosynthesis into two generalized reactions. There are the light reactions that take place when light is present. You need to have light to do these reactions. 
And then there's the Calvin cycle. You may have heard dark reactions. Um, it's not that they have to take place at night or in the dark, just that they don't require light. They're happening in the stroma of the chloroplast. If we look at the light reactions, the ones that take place in the presence of light, again, they are going to capture the energy coming from the sun. They do that through chlorophyll absorbing solar energy. This excites or energizes electrons. Electrons move down an electron transport chain. This electron transport chain is going to pump hydrogen ions into the thylakoids. And then that electron transport chain uses that pumped in hydrogen to make ATP out of ADP and NADPH out of NADP. And again, that NADP, NADPH, those are going to be uh, those co factors, coenzymes, things that are necessary in order for this enzyme enzymatic reaction to take place. The Calvin cycle reactions, the ones that don't require sunlight, they used to be called dark reactions. Now we call it the Calvin cycle reactions. That is where the carbon dioxide coming from the atmosphere into the into the leaf is reduced. Reduced meaning that it's gaining electrons. Um, reactions use ATP that we made in the light reactions and NADPH that we made in the light reactions to make sugar. This Calvin cycle got its name from Melvin Calvin who um, used a carbon isotope so with more neutrons to trace what was happening in photosynthesis. So as much as I know some of you are really going to dislike me after this chapter, um, I, I ask you to direct your anger to Mr. Calvin um, for using this isotope to figure out how it works. And then we learned in our last chapter that photosynthesis is an oxidation reduction or redox reaction. Oxidation is the loss. So oil, oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain or adding of electrons. In photosynthesis specifically, carbon dioxide is reduced. Carbon dioxide is reduced. It gains electrons. Water is oxidized or loses electrons. Here is just this example um, showing you that one of our byproducts, the most important byproduct that plants make for us is oxygen. So this is our underwater plant um, and we can see these bubbles are oxygen. Without cyanobacteria, algae, and plants, we would never have made an atmosphere in our planet to have life as we know it. Um, so thank a plant, thank some algae, thank some cyanobacteria um, for the oxygen that you breathe in order for your cells to have energy. Here is our overview. We're going to break down in very simple, before it gets more complex, what is happening in photosynthesis. You have your plant cell. Within that plant cell, you have a chloroplast. Solar energy, light energy, is going to reach into that chloroplast into these thylakoid membranes where it's going to be absorbed by chlorophyll. When we combine it with water and carbon dioxide from the outside environment that's in this leaf getting to this plant cell, we can have our light reactions happening um, where we are going to make some coenzymes NADPH and we are going to make ATP. From those light reactions, we have this byproduct of oxygen. Then out in the stroma, we're taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. 
and we are going through a process, a cycle of reactions where we're using ATP and NADPH from the light reactions in order to make a sugar. We need both light reactions and dark reactions to continue this process in a chloroplast. So let's take a look first at plants and how they convert solar energy. In order to do this, we have pigments and something we call photosystems. Pigments are just like what you imagine them. That's this colored molecule. Um, and this chemical can absorb certain wavelengths of light. The wavelengths that are not absorbed by the pigments are reflected. So when you look at a plant and it looks green, that's because it's reflecting that green light back and it's absorbing the other colors. Um, there is this spectrum of absorption. So the pigments in chlorophyll absorb different visible light. And if we think back to some physics, visible light is that rainbow that you see through a prism going from purple and blues, greens, yellows, oranges, reds. And so we are absorbing various colors of the rainbow and we're reflecting back green light. Um, so chlorophyll as a whole is gonna absorb red and blue and reflect green. Chlorophyll is one of several kinds of pigments that we find in plants to absorb sunlight. There are carotenoids and accessory pigments which absorb violet, blue, green, and reflect yellow and orange. You have seen these carotenoids and accessory pigments if you've ever seen a tree change colors of its leaves in the fall. You get the pretty yellows and oranges and reds because we lose the chlorophyll. It, it goes away, it dies off. There's not as much sunlight in the fall. And we see then the other accessory pigments, the yellow, the red, the oranges. Here is an example sort of showing you what is happening. So we have this wavelength that makes um, the electromagnetic spectrum going from really, really short, fast, quick bursts of waves those are our gamma rays, then x-rays, then UV rays, the stuff that comes from the sun that can cause cancer. Uh, then there's this visible light spectrum that we see as purple, blue, green, yellow, oranges, and red. And then there's infrared light, which are these bigger, slower waves down to radio waves. Within this visible light spectrum, we see that there are types of chlorophyll, accessory pigments, and carotenoids that absorb certain wavelengths of light. Most of what we're discussing is going to be chlorophyll as a whole, but there is chlorophyll type A and chlorophyll type B. We see that they're slightly different in what they absorb, but they do overlap. Uh, and then carotenoids, which can also uh, give us a absorption for green light. We have these different pigments so that we're not wasting any of that sunlight that is shining down. We're trying to absorb as much of the energy as we can to drive this photosynthesis. Within our light and our Calvin cycle reactions, we then need to break this even further into what is happening. So the light reactions have two alternate electron pathways, two ways that this happens within the light reactions. And it has all to do with these 
photosystems or this set of chemical reactions that we're going to look at. We have non-cyclical pathways or not in a cycle and cyclical pathways. They are in a cycle. What that means is that light shines down onto the leaf and it goes to that chloroplast that has the chlorophyll. Light reactions capture that light energy and there are two photosystems in which it can capture this. There's photosystem number one and photosystem number two. Weirdly enough, we figured out photosystem number one uh, and photosystem number two in a sort of backwards discovery. So when we look at this, we're going to see photosystem two coming first and then photosystem one happening after. Um, it's okay. It's, it's, we're going to see how it all happens. Um, but just, just know they have numbers, but that's not necessarily the order in which light is, is working here. Okay. What is a photosystem? It's just this complex, this set of pigments that collect the solar energy, kind of like an antenna scooping up and, and picking up sound waves, right? You have your antenna on your car, or if you watch um, TV with an antenna, right? It gathers in the different channels of radio or channels on the TV and displays it. Same thing here, the photosystems gather, collect the sunlight energy, and then send it out. These photosystems are located in the thylakoid membranes. Both our cyclic pathway and our non-cyclic pathway make ATP. The main job of those photosystems is to take the energy from the sun and turn it into ATP. The non-cyclic pathway also makes that coenzyme NADPH. That NADPH is important when we look at our Kelvin cycle. So we need to have both cyclic and non-cyclic pathways happening. Let's first take a look here at the non-cyclic pathway. We're going to look at it in words and then we're going to look at it in pictures. The non-cyclic pathway, we already know it's this whole thing is taking place in thylakoid membrane. It is going to use both photosystems. It's going to use photosystem number one and photosystem number two. The step-by-step -step way this happens is photosystem two captures the light energy. This is where it sort of goes out of order, right? Photosystem two captures light energy. Non-cyclic pathway is always going to start with that photosystem two capturing light from the sun. Once that light energy gets captured, it makes an electron pop out be ejected. And this is from chlorophyll type A. And that electron is going to move stair step down an electron transport chain to photosystem one. How do we replace that electron once we spit it out of photosystem two? Well, we will replace it with an electron from water. So we're going to split H2O and we're going to make O2 and we're going to make a hydrogen ion. So we're going to split these waters. What that means is we're constantly splitting up these waters and we're gathering or gaining, accumulating hydrogen ions in the thylakoid chambers inside of those membranes. There is this hydrogen gradient and that's storing up some energy, chemical energy, that is going to make ATP. So in summary so far, light shines down on a plant into the chloroplast containing chlorophyll. That light energy excites an electron that is going to get spit out, shot out of photosystem 2, fall down into photosystem 1. 
then photosystem one is going to capture light energy and eject an electron. And this electron is permanently moved and attached to NADP plus to make NADPH. So this is the word version. And like I said, there's going to be a lot of memorizing. So if we break it down, light shines, hits the chloroplast in the thylakoid membrane. That light energy causes an electron to be shot out of photosystem two, fall stair step down into photosystem one, light shines on that, spits that electron back out, and now it's going to fall down those stair steps in order to combine to make NADPH. So here's in picture version. Solar energy comes in. This is our light reaction where we are then having the light hit photosystem two, spit out an electron that's going to fall down and make ATP, uh, spit out an electron in photosystem one to fall down and make NADPH. What does it look like if we just look at those photosystems? Energy from the sun is shining down, 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 hitting those pigments, that reaction center in photosystem two. When that energy hits photosystem two, an electron gets excited and it has more energy. With photosystem two, we're taking water, breaking it apart, and we make these hydrogen ions. This excited electron that happened is going to fall down an electron transport chain, making ATP on its way. And it goes into photosystem one, where sunlight shines on it. An electron gets excited. It's going to fall down and make a D or N A D P H. Complicated process absolutely it is going to require some memorizing to know that this is what our light reaction is happening or what is happening here but really sunlight into the chloroplast into the thylakoid membrane sunlight is exciting an electron in this chlorophyll complex we call it photosystem two that electron is excited so it raises up an energy and that is going to be released as it falls down this transport chain it makes ATP along the way and it ends up in photosystem one again light is going to shine on photosystem one make that electron excited as it falls down in energy it makes NADPH if we did not have water, we would run out of electrons. So the good news is water is being split into hydrogen and into oxygen. So that um, electron is being replaced. This is where we're getting our oxygen byproduct. Water is going into the light reaction. Oxygen is coming out. Okay. So they break it for you even more. Photosystem two has that pigment complex and electron acceptor. It's gonna get electrons when we split up water and oxygen gas is released. We, fall, we follow this electron down an electron transport chain. Think of it like a slinky falling downstairs. And that is going to have these other complexes called cytochrome and plasmacunin um, that is going to carry electrons between photosystem two and one. So we start in photosystem two, excite that electron, it falls down into photosystem one, where we then excite that electron and um, we will make NADPH. How did we make ATP with this electron transport chain? 
Well, we know that we're breaking apart um, water to make hydrogen and oxygen. When we break apart water, we're increasing pumping hydrogen from the stroma into the thylakoids. That pumped in hydrogen is going to go back out of that thylakoid membrane through an enzyme called ATP synthase. It allows for the hydrogen to flow. When hydrogen is flowing through it, it is going to join an ADP and a phosphorus to make ATP. Here's even more zoomed in. We started again, sun coming into the chloroplast, into the thylakoid. We also need water. If we are looking at uh, splitting that water, we'll pump in hydrogens. There's extra hydrogens coming in to the thylakoid membrane. We're having oxygen gas that's left behind when we break apart water, leaving the cell. Light comes into that photosystem. The electron gets excited. It's going to go through this electron transport chain. It's going to go into photosystem one, where energy from the sun hits it. Then it's going to make a NADPH. We're replacing the electron we lost with one of these hydrogens when we broke apart water. We see here that there is this enzyme called ATP synthase. As we get more and more and more hydrogen from breaking apart water, hydrogen wants to leave, to, to diffuse and move out of the cell. It does that by going through ATP synthase, which will then make ATP. This process of hydrogen leaving out of ATP synthase is called chemiosmosis. The electron transport chain that we said was like a slinky getting pushed downstairs, it's just a bunch of enzymes that are working together. So our thylakoid space, we said it acts like this reservoir, it holds on to hydrogen ions. Every time water gets oxidized, two hydrogens are in the thylakoid membrane space and we are transferring that electron into the electron transport chain and when it falls down out of that we're making energy. That energy is used to pump more hydrogens into the thylakoid membrane. The flow of the hydrogens back out of that space is what makes ATP synthase work. ATP synthase is making ATP. And of course, this method we just said is called chemiosmosis because ATP production is tied to that hydrogen gradient, more hydrogen inside of the thylakoid membrane. Why do you care about this or why should it matter in any way? Well, it's tied to making oxygen, right? We, we know that we're breaking apart water to make oxygen. And with this, tropical rainforests are being destroyed at an alarming rate. We already talked about that way back at the very beginning in like chapter 47. Tropical rainforests exists anywhere that temperatures are above about 26 degrees Celsius and rainfall is somewhere between 100 to 200 centimeters and it's very regular. Most tropical rainforest plants are very woody. There's vines, there's epiphytes, but there's not really an understory or under that canopy. Tropical rainforests are going to take in CO2, right? That's what we need to get into the cell to do photosynthesis. That's in our second part here. And that uptake slows down global warming. But as we develop, we destroy tropical rainforests and it's been reduced from 15 to 5 percent of the Earth's surface. And this deforestation accounts for 10 to 20 percent of atmospheric CO2 and it removes the CO2 sink where we, we are taking it out of the atmosphere.
Then when we burn fossil fuels and even that forest area, we're adding even more CO2 to the air. And this is increasing the global temperature. So not only do we reduce oxygen that could help us with our ozone layer, we're adding even more CO2 and we have nowhere for that CO2 to go. Um, if we look at records of this uh, CO2 amount and the global temperature change, um, we see that overall we have this sharp increase in atmospheric temperatures and ocean temperatures over time. Um, and that fluctuation is only projected to continue and will have devastating effects on Earth. Okay, so now we know the generalized process in which we are taking water and making oxygen in plants. Before we can get into that CO2 part, we want to talk about plants fixing carbon dioxide or taking atmospheric carbon and turning it into an organic molecule. This is going to be a cyclical series of reactions. We are going to use atmospheric carbon dioxide and we're going to make carbohydrates. This whole thing is known as C3 photosynthesis. Why is it called that? It has three stages. There's carbon dioxide fixation, there's carbon dioxide reduction, and there's something called Ruby P. It's this enzyme that we're going to make and use that we need to regenerate. So CO2 comes into the plant in our Calvin cycle, and it's going to be attached to this five carbon molecule called Ruby P. It's attached by an enzyme called Ruby P carboxylase. This is going to make a six carbon structure molecule. That six carbon molecule is then going to split into two three carbon molecules. We call it 3PG. There is this reaction that is accelerated or sped up by Ruby P carboxylase. It is also called Rubisco. So essentially we are bringing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into our Calvin cycle, immediately attaching those carbons from CO2 into a six carbon molecule from Ruby P. And then that's not very stable and breaks into two, three carbons. CO2 is now fixed. It went from being an atmospheric inorganic molecule to an organic molecule into a carbohydrate. So we are no longer looking at our light reaction. We made NADH and we made ATP when we had our sunlight come in. Now we're gonna look at that CO2 going into our Calvin cycle. And again, that very first step of that Calvin cycle is going to be taking carbon dioxide, adding it to Ruby P and making this six carbon molecule that will immediately break into three carbon molecule, three PG. So here's that happening. Carbon dioxide goes in, combines with Ruby P and that enzyme, making a big six carbon molecule into our three carbon molecule. There's our three carbon molecule. Now we need the ATP that we made in our light reactions in order to make another intermediate, another carbon molecule. After we make that other intermediate carbon molecule, we need the NADPH that we made in the light reactions to make something called G3P, 
we're going to make 6G3P. We'll see in a moment, GP3 is this important stepping stone because it can be converted into many different molecules in the plant, one of those being glucose. We're not done with this cycle yet. We'll see that our G3P becomes glucose or other molecules. But we want to get back to Ruby P. So not all of that G3P goes into this process. We'll see that five of those G3Ps go back into this cycle. We're going to need more energy. And then we are going to make our Ruby P again. So overall, carbon dioxide comes in. Three carbon dioxides come in. We're going to first add it to Ruby P to make a six carbon molecule. Immediately that breaks into a three carbon molecule. We're going to add six ATP that we made in the light reaction. That's going to make another intermediate. Then we are going to add six NADPH. That's going to make 6G3P. That can become glucose or other organic molecules in the plant. The majority, five of them, are going to be recycled using three more ATP to get back to Ruby P so that this cycle can happen again. So there's the carbon fixation, the carbon reduction, and the regeneration of Ruby P. That is your Calvin cycle or this dark reaction, if you've heard it called that before. So 3PG turns into this intermediate we call BPG. BPG reduces to make G3P. If you don't remember this intermediate, that's okay. Just know that we have carbon dioxide coming in combining with Ruby P, making a six carbon molecule, breaks into a three carbon molecule. Add in ATP, get another carbon molecule, that's the BPG. Add in NADPH, that's getting us G3P. Electrons and energy are required for this 3PG B PG, G, 3P thing to happen. Or from going from that carbon fixation into that reduction and then into either making sugar or regenerating Ruby P. This stage is where we are using the NADPH and the ATP that we made in the light reactions. We can reduce reduce, so give electrons to G3P to make it become glucose or other organic molecules. Here's that process that is, let's go back a second, that is right here, zoomed in. So what's happening? We have our 3PG, we add in the energy, that's gonna give us this intermediate where we add in our NADPH, our coenzyme, and we make G3P. G3P is our important molecule to restore Ruby P and to make molecules in the plant. So Ruby P that we used, we have to replace it. So our Calvin cycle, it's a cycle and it has to go through three turns in order for our five G3P and give us our three Ruby P. So three circles around that cycle three turns of this is what is going to give us our regeneration and our G3P. 
So you may see three carbon dioxides coming in. That's because we need to do this three times with our three carbon dioxides. And it shows you here why that works. It's because you're making a uh, three carbon molecule, G3P, uh, and we need it to go back to a five carbon molecule, Ruby P. So five times three or three times five. So we need three cycles. So you'll have five G3P to give you three Ruby P. Why do you care? That G3P can be made into many molecules. It can make fatty acids and glycerol to make oil in the plants. It can make glucose, a simple sugar. It can make fructose. It can make starch and cellulose. It can make amino acids. So that G3P is this base molecule that allows plants to build their structure to make their own food. So where does GP or G3P go? It can become glucose phosphate and make sugar. It can go into fatty acids. It can go into amino acids. Those glucose phosphate can become fructose. It can become starch. It can become cellulose. So it's this base molecule being made starting with our light reactions to give us ATP and NADPH, moving into our Calvin cycle to give us this G3P that will then go through more reactions to become something in the plant. The majority of plants are going to do that C3 photosynthesis. They're going to use Ruby P and they are going to fix carbon dioxide. This is all going to happen in that mesophyll green leaf tissue. But not all plants live in places where it is sunny and moist enough for this to happen. In hot, dry climates, the stomata, the under part of the leaf that's opening to let carbon dioxide in and oxygen out, uh, have to close so that the plants don't dry out in the middle of the day. What that means is carbon dioxide is actually going to decrease as the plant does photosynthesis and the oxygen is going to increase. Oxygen will combine with Ruby P and it's gonna then make more carbon dioxide in the plant. We call this photorespiration. And these types of plants um, sometimes get called CAM uh, plants or C4 plants. These C4 or CAM plants solve this problem of photorespiration. They don't want to build back up CO2. They do this by creating another type of molecule called PEP. And we can also make oxaloacetate. And then uh, these plants avoid that photorespiration. And at night, when it is cool, they can reopen the stomata, release their oxygen, and not damage the plant. Um, the fun part of that is that C4 cam plants actually have a more productive way of doing photosynthesis uh, than our normal C3 plants. So they are actually better at taking in carbon. They are better at doing photosynthesis. They release more oxygen. They make more sugar. But in a normal, moist, more cool environment, those C4 plants just can't compete with the C3 plants. They're, uh, they tend to, in many cases, be a little bit smaller and slower growing. Think like cactuses are these types of CAM C4 plants. Um, and while they can grow very large, it takes them a while to do it. 
Whereas your C3 plants, think of like grass and an oak tree that just grow faster. Um, but there, there is this adaptation to be able to live in drier climates. Um, one way in which scientists know that there is this evolution of land plants is that this C4 process is actually more productive, but it's not the main way plants do photosynthesis. So a lot of times with evolution, things that worked just stick around, even if they aren't necessarily the best way. Um, for, but the best way for an environment, a natural selection happened for C4 plants. Um, so there you go, types of photosynthesis. When we look at C4 plants and C3 plants, we're gonna see some differences in the way their leaf structures are. A C3 plant has these mesophyll cells like really packed at the top of the leaf. And we will also see these vascular areas where we're moving sugar and water, uh, water to the leaf, sugar away, um, sort of um, underneath that. And then this opening called the stoma for oxygen to get out and carbon dioxide to get in. In a C4 plant, we don't just have this line on the surface to try to capture as much sunlight as possible. It's hot, it's dry, we're capturing plenty of sunlight. We actually see these cells in like a circle around the vein that is gonna carry the uh, sugar and water. And that's because we're putting carbon dioxide into these other molecules and holding on to it until we can open this stoma at night to allow oxygen out and CO2 in. Um, so again, we've got carbon dioxide coming in and we are putting it with Ruby P, um, adding in ATP and adding in uh, NADPH, making intermediates that will then end up being G3P. Uh, and then recycling Ruby P. That's the normal C3 plant. In the C4 plant, uh, carbon dioxide is coming in and it is being fixed into that PEP, that other molecule, and holding on to it until later. Uh, and then it will go through that Calvin cycle. That CAM photosynthesis, uh, we're really just doing carbon fixation and waiting, waiting. Instead of the, the, the cell space, now we're waiting till night. Uh, so at nighttime, CAM plants will fix that CO2 uh, and they'll make C4 molecules that we store in vacuoles. And then during the day, when we have NADPH and ATP from our light reactions, then we are going through and doing photosynthesis. Um, so that's something like a pineapple. We have carbon dioxide coming in at night and being stored. And then in the daytime, when we have light reactions, we are able to do the Kelvin cycle. So these different ways to do photosynthesis have advantages and disadvantages. It really just depends on where that plant is. C4 plants can be in really high light intensities, high temperatures, just a little bit of rainfall, and they're happy to be there. C3 plants can live in cold temperatures and with a lot of moisture. And CAM plants can live in deserts, extreme arid things. Uh, and there's only about 23 different plants that have that and some non-flowering plants too. All right, so that's really the process. But um, I want to go back real quick just to sum this all back up for us in one of our diagrams. Maybe it will let me go all the way here. Just so we're clear on like what is happening in our reactions as a whole. Um, sunlight is coming in, 
hitting a chloroplast into the thylakoid membrane where we have chlorophyll in photosystem two, then that electron that is there is getting excited. It's getting sent up out of that photosystem where it falls down an electron transport chain into photosystem one. Photosystem one, that electron is shot back up where it is gonna fall down and it's gonna make NADPH. That NADPH, NATP, is gonna go into the Kelvin cycle. In the Kelvin cycle, we take CO2. We're gonna add Ruby P to make a six carbon molecule that will break into a three carbon molecule. We then will add NATP. It'll make an intermediate where we'll add in NADPH. That is gonna make G3P. We need to turn that cycle um, three times in order to regenerate our Ruby P and then have our G3P become sugar or other molecules in the plant. So that's this whole process happening. All right, as always, there are lots of resources on the D2L for you. There is, of course, Quizlet. There is your textbook. There is a study guide. Of course, feel free to ask me questions as you're going through those things um, and as you need help. Um, and then also for anything that has pictures, there's these long descriptions in case my description is not enough for you. And of course, ask questions for anything that you need. Um, good luck studying for your quiz. Good luck studying um, for your homework. And of course, uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks for watching.